we, we, we run, we run live from 12 to 5, that rhymes, uh, and then we play it overnight again, in case you missed it, and we put it on YouTube, and then we put it on Olelo, and sometimes we put it on OC16. Carl Kim, thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. It's great to have you here. I've been trying to do this for years. Yes. Finally, yeah, yeah, right. aha, success, <laughs> Eureka. Right, right. <laughs> so Carl Kim is a professor of planning at UH, um, and we're going to talk about planning today here on Community Matters. We're calling this show Planning Public Spaces in Hawaii, and one of the reasons is that Carl is a, a part of our program on May 21st, which is called, huh, surprise, Planning Public Spaces, well, Public Spaces in Hawaii. How to plan, design, build, fund, uh, manage, maintain, and preserve them. Actually, I can't be part of your program on May 21st, and that's why you asked me to be on this show. That's right. Because that's I'm right. going to be... Okay, you uh, can't. Yeah, so yeah, stop yeah, that. Right, yeah. right, right. Okay. Okay. But we're, we're going to try to capture everything right. you might have said right, right. Uh, at that program. In fact, we may play part of this. Aloha, my program. name is Paul Jackson, <laughs> better known as PJ. So Carl Kim is a PhD in planning, uh, at, trained at MIT. That's correct. Okay, and he's also actively involved in the Federal Disaster Center, which talks about, among other things, planning for disasters. Right, right. So planning is everything. And frankly, Carl, I'll tell you now, Hawaii doesn't do enough of it, so good for you right. that you're here to try to train everybody in that. Um, so I guess, uh, I guess uh, just for you know, perspective, can, can you tell the people, well, first, anything more about your training that's relevant to this discussion? Well, you know, um, our, my, I was trained in, in urban and regional planning, uh, which looks at uh, many um, different topics related to cities and settlements and uh, how, how we manage those resources. More recently, I've been focusing on uh, the disasters, uh, natural disasters, and the connections between urban planning, actually even open space, open space management, uh, and in public space, uh, and disaster risk reduction. You know, over the weekend, we had this really uh, catastrophic disaster in uh, Nepal, a 7.8 uh, uh, earthquake about 50 miles west of uh, Kathmandu, which in addition to the earthquake, there, were, there have been something like 50 aftershocks of uh, more than four uh, uh, magnitude, um, and two aftershocks, which were um, six and 6.6 .6 and 6.7. And this is a very... Uh, devastating earthquake. Uh, it, it was actually 15.8 times stronger than the 2010 earthquake that uh, er, occurred in uh, no no that occurred in uh, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. uh, the Fukushima earthquake was stronger and bigger bigger than this one. Uh, this is in a very uh, active part of the of the world in terms of um, uh, uh, earthquake forces. Um, this earthquake al occurred along a 1,400-mile fault zone um, between uh, the Indian uh, plate and the Eurasian plate. And basically what's happening is the Indian plate is subducting or going below the Eurasian plate at about uh, 5 centimeters or um, 2 inches per year, which actually is quite a lot in uh, geologic uh, time and space. This time, uh, this earthquake shifted about 2 meters or, or more than 6 feet. Um, and, and that's what caused the devastating uh, damage uh, in, in the region. Um, I don't know if I can show this yeah, go ahead. I image, which... Uh, Let's look at... Uh There's been a, a lot of collapsed buildings. Uh, there have been uh, extensive damage in the urban areas, which we uh, have been able to follow. The search and uh, rescue operations are currently underway. Extensive damage to the roadways and infrastructure, which I think is also uh, hampering uh, the relief and, and rescue efforts uh, as well, too. And then also there's really been um, significant loss of important um, cultural assets. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are something like four of the seven uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites that were uh, destroyed in, uh, or uh, heavily damaged in this. The numbers keep going up and up, but, um, uh, but actually there are probably closer to 4,000 uh, fatalities and 6,500 or 7,000 uh, injured. And, uh, and then also we expect these numbers to really go up uh, as we get out to the remote and uh, rural areas. Um, the costs are going to be staggering. I mean, a large number of people were affected by this. Uh, this is a poor country, so this is 
uh, going to be something like uh, at nine to fifty percent of the GDP's uh, estimate in terms of uh, damages. And already there's been tremendous amounts of efforts to uh, to, to respond and provide relief. Well, let me let me terms. say that health um, health care in uh, Nepal is not that good. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, from Hawaii every year, Aloha Medical Mission, Brad Wong, right. they go there and they chip in on the health care. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, and actually, if you could bring up the, the final screen, there there are these relief efforts underway, and so uh, for those who are interested in supporting or donating to help with the rescue, uh, relief, and recovery efforts, the Society of the uh, Nepalese in uh, Hawaii, uh, which is a um, nonprofit organization, is is raising funding for it, and so you can just go to this uh, link and then um, offer support, but. Um, even though that's not what we were to talk about today. Um, but but I, make I think it relevant it's for me. Why does a guy like you, with your training, right. care professionally right, 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 about right. what happened in the past? I mean, to me, this is all about land use planning. It's about building codes. It's about designing cities that are safe um, and secure. And uh, this is part of the important work of um, urban regional planning. That's a big focus of our, of our work right now. As I think uh, you know, I now direct the National Disaster Preparedness yes. Training Center. It's funded by FEMA and Homeland Security, and we're focused on natural disasters like earthquakes and tsunamis and uh, hurricanes, uh, and then uh, and then also uh, looking at uh, communities um, uh, that are exposed to these risks. And, and a moment on that. I mean, we can be, probably we will be instrumental in the rescue effort in Nepal, one way or the other. Yeah, uh, yeah I mean, we have a, a big presence here with, uh, with with PACOM, with many uh, organizations um, in Hawaii uh, connected to the DOD, connected to the, the federal government uh, that will be called upon to, to assist with this. Right now, we're still in the uh, damage assessment phase yeah. uh, of this. Um, and I think it, it, it is looking very, very serious. And, and I think we have, we have lots of concerns. I, uh, you know, I have many students from Nepal. I have many uh, colleagues and, and, and close friends in Nepal, and we're still getting uh, feedback and, and information. But one thing that you'll be happy to know is the, the, that's making a big difference is the telecommunications and the internet and the connectivity through smartphones. Uh, and and uh, that, uh, uh, even though the, the networks have been um, overwhelmed, uh, the, the systems are still um, uh, operational, which is uh, something important to uh, to learn. So. Well, you know, only 10 days ago or so, we had uh, our regular reporter on energy who was visiting uh, mm -hmm. um, Kathmandu, and we had a connection with him on Skype, and it was fine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Luckily, he right. left the day before right. the earthquake. Right, right. I think there are important lessons that are coming out of this. I mean, one of the things that the, I, 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 uh, I've heard about is the telecommunications company is trying to limit the number of texts that are going on. They give 50 free texts to, to people. Uh, and uh, things, things like that, uh, other practices that uh, we might learn from and adapt uh, or adopt here in Hawaii should something uh, catastrophic occur. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, right. Well, that's the thing, you know, I mean, who would have thunk when you were in school that, that uh, disaster planning, disaster management would become so important for mm -hmm. a planner? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, it's part of climate change, isn't right. it? Right. And we're going to have bad storms in climate change. We are having bad storms mm -hmm. in climate change. So. Who would have thought? But here you are, and you're really in the center of it. The planning is in the center mm -hmm. of climate change. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it, I think it might be useful to have some definition of planning, Please. too, because most people really don't know what planners do. And, and kind of fundamentally, planning is about the connection between knowledge and action. Uh, it's actually about choices. Uh, there's a planning theorist, uh, Paul Davidoff, who wrote this uh, choice theory uh, of planning argument. And what he said is that we can make better decisions if we're fully aware of all the alternatives or uh, choices. And, and so I think that's, that, that's really what, what, what planning is about. A lot of times we focus on the physical environment, but it is also the social environment. It is also the cultural environment and, and so forth. And it's, it's gotten more sophisticated since you went to school anyway. Yeah, right? I, I, would so. I would hope so. Society, right, right. I, 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 I would hope so. Right, I would hope so. We're not <laughs> talking about right. age here, right. 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 No, but planning fundamentally is about learning, too. Uh, it's about learning what works and what doesn't work. Uh, it, it's actually about learning what our values are 
uh, and what we think is important, what's worth preserving, um, what things do we want to change, what do we want to keep the same, how do we measure success, uh, and, and how do we know that um, we have succeeded or made improvements both individually and collectively as a society. So that kind of in a nutshell is what planning is about and, and what we do. But one more extension sure. on that though. You, by, by definition, you're planning the future of a given society, a given community, a given city. Um, and that means you have to deal, interact with the public and the political infrastructure. Yes. It's yeah. got to be a yeah. substantial part of what you do. Yeah, it, it's working with the public. It's working with government. It's working with uh, NGOs and institutions. Uh, it really is a whole of society uh, endeavor to, to do right and to do effectively. Right? Yeah. So. so there you are, university, mm -hmm. you know, up on the hill and with the ivy, whatnot. But you're actually you're, you're down you're down with the people. You're actively participating in the planning process of our community. How does that work? Well, I, I think it, we need to engage uh, all of those who are affected by plans. Um, and in part because uh, we're a democracy. Uh, in part, uh, what we really do believe in is that the people should uh, be deeply engaged in this. And I mean, that is the definition of democracy. I mean, the, the rule of the people, right? And so, uh, and, and government is just an extension uh, of that. Uh, sometimes we forget that. But uh, uh, anyway, so that, that, that's part of what okay. we do. Well, and, and what we teach. And so those of you out there who are interested in getting a master's degree in urban and regional planning or a graduate certificate in disaster management and humanitarian assistance, um, come join us at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. We're Web always website, looking for a few. Website, right? website. www.durp.hawaii.edu. Direct, di uh, the, uh, Department, Department of, of Urban, Urban and Regional, regional Planning. Hawaii.edu. Right. That's just really important. Right. Would you agree with me, Carl, uh, in the thought that uh, in Hawaii, we, we missed out on opportunities to plan over a long time. But now, um, it's kind of a tipping point for us. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I agree with you. That's a, that's a uh, keen observation. Uh, you know, uh, this is a critical point. I mean, we've got big projects coming in. I mean, the, 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 the rail project, uh, Kaka'ako, uh, the redevelopment of different communities. And, uh, and so this is a really kind of critical time. Uh, that I think some key decisions that are going to be made in the uh, this year, the current uh, in the current environment, are going to influence uh, the shape and future of Hawaii for uh, a long time. I mean, in the 30 years I've been here, this has been one of the the periods that I I, I really see this is uh, this is a critical time. Yeah, it's only beginning now in a funny way. Only beginning now. Well, I, I mean, it's it's been moving along. I mean, it's been and there there are many factors related to it. I mean, part of it is the world economy. Part of it's Hawaii's position uh, of relative to that and uh, other sorts of changes. Uh, so, but uh, this is an important topic. I also feel, and you don't have to agree with me at all about this. Remember Clockwork Orange? Oh, yeah. Where they uh, held a fellow's head right, in right, a, right, a little right, vice right, and right, made his yeah, eyes yeah, over. Right, right. Okay, I, I think that before <laughs> any politician takes office, mm -hmm. he has to go to a special course right. in planning, uh -huh. and he has to sit in that chair. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> I'll, let, I'll let you manage that one, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. We're going to take a short break on that one. Okay. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about planning public spaces, which is a subset of planning, but really important in Hawaii at this point in time. I'm Jay Fidel. That's Carl Kim. We'll be right back. Aloha. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute and host on Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii broadcast network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Think of the sad alternative, let's not work together. Here in Hawaii, with all of our diversity and the richness of the people, it's important for us to come together around issues on the, the basis of what's right, what's good, and what's going to serve the common good. And that's what we try to do at Ehana Kako. Every week we interview movers and shakers, people in government, business, and other sectors of society to talk about how to create together a better government, economy, a better world here in Hawaii that can bless the rest of the world. I thank you for your attention to Think Tech Hawaii, and we look forward to seeing you 
every Monday, 2 to 3 p.m., on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We're Ehana Kako, and we wish you well. Aloha. Back. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're having fun on a, on a Monday noon <laughs> with Dr. Carl Kim of UH, and he's a, a planning, uh, regional, urban and regional planning professor. Yes and a researcher, and he's also into a disaster, the Federal Disaster Center, which is, to me, very closely related to planning in general. And we're, we're going to talk more now about planning public spaces in Hawaii. Because, uh, you know, Hawaii may not have enough public spaces, my opinion anyway. Uh, it needs to have more for the development of its own society. Uh, you know, some people would say, Carl, that in the, in, in the day of social media, um, you could just sit at home uh, with your or in a co-working space, <laughs> sit at home with your phone, and then go home and look at television and, and eat fast food, and you don't need any social engagement whatsoever. But that's not really true, and, and public spaces are part of this whole experience of, of creating a community, engaging the public. What, what, what's your thought about that? Yeah, I, uh, well, I mean, I think that would be an awful boring world if you just sat at <laughs> home and ordered all your food in and you never really got out. And, you know, in, in some quarters, that's where the, the world is moving for. But I think we should begin in, by sort of defining and, and thinking about what we mean by public space. You know, first it's the street and the sidewalk uh, and the, the yard, the street corner. It's also uh, parks. In Hawaii, we have beaches. Uh, other places have riverfronts. Uh, in Hawaii, we have canal areas as, as well, too. It's also con uh, uh, grown to mean also like the town square uh, or the mall, like the Great Mall in Washington, D.C. Uh, but there are also other malls that are kind of like shopping, shopping malls. malls. <laughs> right, right. Uh, Is uh, that public? Pedest pedestrian <laughs> malls. And so, 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 so in one way, I, I think it's a physical space, right? But the other aspect of it is it is a social space. It is a gathering space. It is a place for commerce and trade. But it is also a place of expression. It's a, a, it's a place where people interact and exchange with others. Um, and so public space is very closely tied to what you do, the public sphere, which I think includes much more than just a physical space. It's about how we interact, how we use technology, and the digital world, the internet, uh, telecommunication systems, broadcasting out. I would include that all within this larger domain of, of, of public space. You know, I was watching uh, this video. It's on, uh, it was a speech by Michael Kimmelman, who was the uh, architectural uh, critic, critic, critic for the New York Times, and he was speaking at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you want to know what pri uh, public spaces is? It's, it's when you walk out your front door until you get to your destination. Everything you pass through, that's public mm -hmm. space. Right, right. right. And, yeah, yeah. and he talked also about the, you know, the days of, of, of Greece and, mm -hmm. and uh, Rome, mm -hmm. um, how they really knew what like they Like Algora were doing. and the, but, yeah, right. Yeah. But again, it was only if you were a citizen that you could actually go and participate in this. And so We've progressed beyond Hopefully. that, right, right. But, but I think that that connection, you know, between the town hall or the city hall or the capital or the legislature, these are public spaces. These are important public spaces. Uh, so I think there's a connection between this public space, public sphere, but also this civic space, which is really critical. This is, I mean, this is a democratic space. It's where we allow the freedom of expression. It's where we allow a diversity of expression and different ideologies and policies and, you know, and, and, and cultures. And, and we live in an increasingly diverse, multicultural world. So public space has to accommodate that. I'm going to add something else to it. I think public space is a pressure valve. When things get really tight and, and congested and, and built up and there's a lot of differences, you need to blow off steam. And, and, and when you see all these, the Tiananmen Square or the, the Arab Spring or the more recent cases, you know, with Occupy, Occupy Wall Street, uh, the Ferguson protests, both, this is, people take to the streets. They take to these public areas uh, in, in part. And it is, this right is guaranteed by our Constitution. The right to assemble, to collectively express your opinions, which may not be the dominant opinion, by the way, uh, this free speech, speech, expression, 
this is this is really this is really important, uh, and that's part of what makes a democratic and and I would argue functioning society. So, I but you know, I mean, to make the other case on that, mm -hmm. you can have a public space that can result in a revolution. Right. Right. Uh, as it happened many times. Right. 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 Uh, you can have a public space that, that results in lots of bloodshed, right. bloodshed right. that you really wonder about right. the next day. Right. Right. Um, so how do, you, how do you control that? I mean, do we need to control public spaces so that oh, I, 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 Obviously, I mean, we have to control things. I mean, we live in a society that has all kinds of, of controls, you know. Uh, but, it's, but still, I think we begin with the fundamental notion about what is public space and the right to public space, the right to expression, and the right to, I mean, it's, uh, to, to express your feelings. And uh, there are these challenges, though, to public space. Yes. Uh, we, have, we regulate public space all the time. We regulate in terms of health and safety, right? Um, you know, we have traffic regulation. You can't s you exceed the speed at a cer certain limit. Uh, we the roads are public. Spaces. The roads are public. Uh, jaywalking is another example. <laughs> right, right, right. You, you know, we, you just can't walk out of the street. At, at any, we have traffic control devices. Uh, you can't ride bicycles on, on, on sidewalks. You can't camp. Uh, on sidewalk, you can't light fires uh, uh, in, in many urban areas. You can't sleep. We, well, that's another that's issue. Another uh, issue. <laughs> issue as well too. Um, and, but we also regulate all the land uses around this public space. I mean, that's the function of zoning. So we don't locate factories next to uh, daycare uh, centers or, you know, apartment buildings next to slaughterhouses. And and so 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 we uh, regulate and control public space to protect uh, health and safety. So that's the, that, that's the first thing. The other thing that's going on here, though, is that we're regulating this space to protect values. Right? Yes. Can, you, can you imagine what would happen if you, know, you have a nice, beautiful house with a, and, and somebody just builds a monstrosity right in front of you, blocking all of your views? And, that, and, and that's part of the reason that, 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 that we uh, regulate this and, and, and control this to ensure that we're preserving value. It, and it's not just economic value, it's also social value and cultural value. And the ability to express yourself and all that. That's right, so. that's right. And so it is a, our land use policies are a measure of our values as well, too. I mean, if you, if you think about cities that have created historic districts or preserved certain buildings or even neighborhoods or, or communities, I mean, it really is about the community coming together and saying, this is very, very important, and, and we want to preserve that. So, <coughs> have we lost our appreciation of public spaces? I mean, in Hawaii, so I remember the um, Marriage Equality uh, Act uh, not too long ago, where everybody came in the rotunda of the legislature, and that was definitely a public space where you could express yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that was um, you know, one, of the t one of the only times I thought that the public spaces, you know, that the legislature, the, the rotunda, was being used as a public space for expression of, you know, very passionate ideas. Um, but there, I can't think of another public space. For example, we took an architectural walk with the walk with the AIA last Saturday. Mm -hmm. we, we filmed that. That'll be on our OC16. Oh, mm -hmm. um, and we looked. I looked anyway for public spaces downtown that fomented mm -hmm. exactly what you're talking mm -hmm. about—the ability to express. So there's one public space that was designed by a internationally known designer of public spaces in front of the Financial Plaza of the Pacific. It's a failure. Nobody ever stood up on a soapbox there. No, there was no speaker's corner. There is no speaker's corner. Tamarind Park in front of Bishop Square, not so bad. The things actually happen there. Uh, but you can't think of any other place. And I think Hawaii maybe, maybe may have lost something in not paying attention to this issue before. I mean, there are a couple ways to react to this. I mean, first, things have gotten much, much more complicated, right? Uh, there are so many, many d uh, different factors going on. The second thing that I feel that we've lost is a culture of planning, a culture of urban design, mm. and a culture of critique. Uh, most major cities, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, uh, there is an architecture critic. You know, for the papers, and we and, and, and there's regular routine engagement and discussion about design, about what is important, what looks good, what you know. And if it and, doesn't, you're going to hear about right, it. Right, and you're going to hear about <laughs> it. And people, and, and there's a certain literacy that that, that comes with that. But yeah. I think the other thing is to, to go back on it is, is that there have been these other 
competing forces over public space. I mean, there's the freedom of expression, the health and uh, safety issue, the protection of property rights, and then this notion of who should be telling us what is aesthetically pleasing or you know, what is our community character. And you put all of this together, it's, it's really complicated. And, and, and competing forces, I mean, the health and safety issues, I think actually has, have been expanded to include things like conservation and preservation of wetlands and recharge areas and creating urban parks disaster and disaster staging areas, areas, disaster and, staging areas yeah. and, 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 and then, the, then the whole notion of how you protect uh, and increase values has also been affected by the different strategies. I mean, one thing that we've seen in city after city is the privatization of public space. I mean, part of it has been the assault on government, that government can't do anything, that government has been cut back. And, and, and so not only are we dismantling the planning capabilities of, uh, of governments, particularly local governments, we're handing over the responsibilities for planning to uh, basically private corporations. And this is what, how you have the, the kind of mollification of, uh, uh, of, 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 of America or the, the creation of, of gated communities or you know, the other, for a while, there's this thing called festival marketplaces, you know, the, like the Aloha Stadium or Southside Seaport or, you know, yeah, these yeah. other places where, oh, it's public space, but it was really managed by a private entity, and they can control access. They can manage this because, well, we can't, we can't leave this up to the, to, to the government. Isn't, to, that, to isn't that true? Because government these days... No, 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 there are examples. They're going to hire, they're going to outsource it anyway, yeah, aren't yeah, they? Be, well, in part because we've dismantled government. Uh, in, in part because we haven't taken it uh, seriously. And I would venture to say that, you know, while the profits may have been there, the challenging issues of being able to accommodate diversity of interests and use, uh, those goals and objectives haven't necessarily this, been met by the, by, by, the, by the privatization of what I believe is um, principally a, a, a public responsibility. It's so. troubling because um, if we've dismantled government, and I absolutely agree with you about that, mm -hmm. uh, how do we remantle it? How do we get it back where it should have been, should be now, in order to you know, have it as, sort of as a funnel of our expression, of our mm -hmm. identity, mm -hmm. and thus create a public mm -hmm. space that meets our requirements? Mm -hmm. Well, I, b I believe in the currency of, uh, of good ideas, of great ideas. And so uh, part of this actually I involves strengthening planning programs, uh, strengthening the education and training of people that are uh, involved in literacy. this. Literacy. Increasing the literacy of this, of bringing back um, a more architectural critique and discussion of, of plans. And then what we have to do is to find good examples of great plans, great streets, great communities, and say, Hey, this isn't that hard. We can e yeah. emulate this. We can make this thing happen, yeah. even here in Hawaii. And yeah. then we can make our uh, community an example for others to follow uh, uh, as well. So that's why these issues are, are so critical. And a big part of this, I think, comes down to how we manage our open space, our parks, our common spaces. I mean, it's no, it's no big challenge if we turn this all over to Dubai or someplace, you know, where everything becomes a, a, a massive brand new mall, right? Uh, what's, what, what, what we need to do is to rededicate ourselves to open space, to public space, to common space, and manage that collectively, not just hand it over to the private sector. And that's a hard, that's a hard challenge to do right now because it's so much easier, you know, for a variety of reasons. Just to, well, 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 let's just walk away from this. Let's, let, let's just hand this over. So. Is so right about that. We'll take another break, Carl, but when we come back, I'd like to uh, sort of take Kaka'ako as a case study <laughs> and see how these principles apply to what's happened or not happened there. That's Carl Kim. Uh, he's a professor of planning at UH Manoa. That's urban and regional planning. He's also on the Federal Disaster Center. Um, and uh, we've been talking about uh, planning public spaces in Hawaii, which is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be right back. There is one. Inspired by an ancient culture, classical Chinese dance, vigorous physicality, timeless stories, 5,000 years of Chinese music and dance, Shen Yun presents authentic Chinese culture. Coming to Blaisdell Concert Hall, May 8th and 9th. Tickets at ShenYun.com or call 808-792-3919. 
Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward uh, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Okay, we're back. We're live. We're here. I'm Jay Fidelis, Carl Kim. And P.S., if you have anything you want to say on Twitter, tweet us at uh, thinktechhi, H-I. Uh, anyway, so some of the points that we need to talk about before we go to the case study in Kaka'ako. Uh, one is uh, terrorism. Things change when you have terrorists in every corner. How do you deal with that on this, in this issue? You know, our center is part of the National Domestic Preparedness Consortium, which was created after the Oklahoma City bombings and then greatly expanded after 9-11. I mean, 9-11 really changed uh, our thinking. I mean, 2,992 people were killed in Pennsylvania, in the, pe in the Pentagon, and, and in New York City. Uh, I think there was like 30 million square feet of uh, office space in lower Manhattan uh, that was destroyed. That was destroyed in about an hour and 42 minutes. One of the buildings I actually have studied is the World Trade Center, and I know that it took almost seven years to build that. So this was a really big, tragic uh, event. Uh, and, and I think it changed the way that it, it, it forced us to really think about the threat of terrorism, the threat of what humans are capable of, uh, of, of doing. And I think it increased our emphasis on security and safety. I mean, it led to the creation of uh, the Department of Homeland Security and the U.S. Uh, Patriot Act. It changed our attitudes, I think, towards surveillance and privacy and eavesdropping and all of these things. That's a permanent so, change, don't right, you think? Right, right. Well, again, it, you know, it, it goes back, it, it comes in waves. And so, I mean, uh, uh, I mean right, right now, I mean, I, th I think that that threat is still there and present and, and affects the way people look at not just public space, but this public sphere that we were talking about right. earlier. Where you, now you have a, a different, a, a new exposure. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, right. so how does that change planning of public spaces? Well, in addition to the natural hazards, I mean, the flooding, the risk of hurricane and earthquakes, we also have to unfortunately consider and think about uh, terrorism and man-made disasters in, in terms of how we manage and, and uh, build and design our, our cities. And part of what we're trying to do is to look at the co-benefits uh, for strengthening um, uh, businesses and uh, buildings and communities against one hazard, how that transfers over to um, other types of hazards. That's so interesting. Right. So whether you have to evacuate because of a bomb threat or because of a tsunami, right? So yeah. A lot of the same principles uh, are, 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 are engaged. In and so part of it is if you design communities to be resilient, uh, they're resilient across all hazards. And so that's part of what, what, what we're interested in, in, in looking so at. That, and that's the most interesting thing. I mean, in terms of, gosh, a, a creative career, nothing comes close to this. But for example, <clears throat> I want a square. I want my square to be big enough to have a crowd, mm -hmm. but I, I, want, I don't want the crowd to be stuck um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, victimized mm -hmm. by terrorism or by the police, for that matter. Mm -hmm. I want there to be exits from right. the square. Right. And I actually designed every inch of the square in a way to minimize the risk of the public to right. be there. Right. right? But how exciting is that? Right, right. But it is, it is actually so, there's so much into this that, uh, that I think is really interesting. I mean, you can actually make uh, areas safer, more humane, more attractive, and better for business at the same time as increasing the security. You know, some years ago, I was involved with this crime prevention through urban, uh, through environmental design. And there are things you can do with lighting. There are things that you can do with uh, landscaping. There, are, there's things that you can do to create an environment where there are eyes on the street. I don't know if you know Jane Jacobs and some of the other, uh, other urban uh, scholars who looked at what created safe communities. 
it was that people were engaged. They take ownership of a place. They take care of each other. So we're, this is the same stuff for resilience that, that, that we've been talking about. And it's so, not true. Even, even the old-fashioned crime, you can, mm -hmm. you can minimize crime by having people right. on the street. Right, right. That's right. <laughs> that, that's right. right. And, 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 and then also create this relationship between uh, the people and uh, law enforcement and others if they're, if they're working in partnership. So technology so, plays a big role a, in this. A right? huge role. Huge role, and someday we'll come on, and I'll come on and talk on, uh, about ubiquitous cities because there's uh, so much interesting stuff that we can do with connecting smartphones oh, and, yeah. and internet and, and, yeah. and, uh, and cameras, 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 cameras and, yeah, right, right, and so forth. Right, so, yeah. so anyway, so can we go back to our um, our case study? Our case study mm -hmm. is Kakaako. Mm -hmm. There's a, a neighborhood that was dormant for so long; right, right, nobody right. wanted to go there. It was it was. Dusty lots and tumbleweed, I used to call it. Mm -hmm. um, now all of a sudden everybody wants a piece of it and there are condominiums going up now as we speak with 40 foot sheer concrete walls and, uh, and units at the top that cost $100 million. Mm -hmm. This, you know, just an intuitive reaction does violence to what we might have expected from this neighborhood that everybody had such great expectations about. Mm -hmm. uh, what about planning in Kakaako? Yeah, that's a it's a big challenge. I mean, on the one hand, it's a tremendous opportunity. It's a huge amount of uh, of area. I mean, they're, they're looking at 14 million uh, additional square feet, and you know, over 20 big towers. That's billions of dollars worth of new investment. And at one level, this is exciting. On the other hand, uh, the other problem is that there was a big change in the land use that was there. Uh, I mean, this was an industrial warehousing, small business, startup business type of environment right uh, and, and and we're losing that uh, space and so one question logically becomes where uh, wh where is that wh where where is the where are these functions uh, going and can you integrate some of these functions into this and I and I think the planning has tried to do uh, some of that when I look at some of the projects that Kamehameha School was trying to do and, and others I mean I, I I think there was an attempt to recognize uh, the inherent values of, of, of what was there before uh, but I think there are huge challenges anytime you have this much development occurring in a, uh, uh, an area and, and, and big challenges in terms of coordinating between the landowners, uh, the developers, uh, the eventual owners of the property, um, and, uh, and then obviously with the redevelopment authority and government, both the state and local government. So this is a big, complicated, messy, fascinating uh, interesting challenge and project, <laughs> which I'm sure you'll be all over in the, the, the coming months and, and well, so forth. Well, you know, it's, I think you, you raise a point that was implicit in our earlier discussion about process. Mm -hmm. You know, planning involves a, a political process, mm -hmm. a social process. You can't just wake up one morning and say, bang, that's mm -hmm. what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the question, I suppose, is what, what have we learned mm -hmm. uh, from the Kaka'ako experience uh, mm -hmm. about, about the process? the best process mm -hmm. of planning. Mm -hmm. Well, the best process is engages all, in, in all the stakeholders. And that's a challenge when you don't even know who the future people are, where they're going to come from, what countries they come from, where, you know, how many are. So that, 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 that's, that becomes a, a challenge. But, but I, I really want to go back to some fundamentals that, uh, that, that I think are important. I mean, I think you could take a very, very sort of small, you know, insular view uh, of planning. You know, Paul and Percival uh, Gridman wrote this book some time ago as uh, planners as the soft cops, right? <laughs> and so there are all these things you can do in planning design to, you know, control people, right? You know, like, like we see this in terms of park benches where you can't sleep on, right? Uh, or putting planter boxes in the middle of the streets. Or just privatizing public space as we were talking about. Or one uh, new or, one that you may not have heard of. It's, right. it's the steel spikes for the homeless, right, right, they right, want to sit down right, on something. They got right, spikes, right, 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 right. Or, 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 or keeping the skateboarders out by you know creating these these, these devices. And so, so, or so, so one way is you can focus on these little details and, and 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 do things like that. But I think the other thing you could do that is really wrong is to turn a blind eye to the social problems, the disparities that exist in our community, and the extent to which projects like uh, Kakaako. Uh, may be exacerbating the disparities between, um, you know, wealthy and, and, and non-wealthy uh, people. Um, I think you can also forget that 
you know, we are now a global market. Yes. Um, and, and part of what we have to do is to manage multinational global capital. Uh, how do we manage offshore investment? Everyone says, oh, we just want more and more and more and more. I, I think there's, so what is going to happen then to local investment? What is going to happen to local businesses? What is going to happen when we bring in all of these uh, competitors? And I think if we miss the bigger picture in, in terms of this, ensuring that Hawaii residents, ensuring that Hawaii businesses, uh, ensuring that Hawaii investors can actually compete in, in, in this space, um, I, I think we will have a, we'll have increasing problems and, and challenges, and and I think we can also miss the boat, uh, you know, in terms of the big things like sea level rise or climate change or you know, uh, forget about the high quality of life that we have right now uh, that, that 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 we need to preserve, that we need to focus on, and so those those are the types of things that you know when I look at, at this project how it's evolving. It cannot be just about investment dollars. And we, do, we have to have better metrics for understanding uh, that this works, that, that this is an improvement uh, for us, for, for everyone in this community. And I think that's challenging. Do you, do you yes, well, I mean, it's, it, you know, I may say it's a planner's delight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what it is. Right, right. All the issues you could ever imagine, they're, mm -hmm. all, they're all here in our case study. Mm -hmm. But you know, what about public spaces in Kakako? The Mother Waldron Park is there. There's the park on the uh, Makai side, which I don't think is really relevant to the Mauka side. Um, how important are parks in a in a in a sky rise or a sky, a skyscraper neighborhood? Uh, yeah, parks and open space and public space are really critical to the functioning of the community as a whole. Otherwise, what you end up building is you know basically these uh, isolated. Uh, fortress-like uh, communities that basically only serve those who live and maybe work in the, in the same tower. And we need a, a better system for integrating land uses and, uh, and, and looking at the collective management of this area as a neighborhood, as a community, uh, as a whole. And so those are, those are some of the challenges that exist. You say neighborhood, and indeed the stakeholders in this neighborhood are mm -hmm. going to be skewed toward people who can afford multi-million dollar condos. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, well, there's a we, significant amount of moderate income and some, uh, some low, low income housing included in, in, in this. But uh, it'll be hard for those kids who go to the co-working spaces, the mm -hmm. millennials mm -hmm. who like to paint on the walls right, right, and all right, that, right, right. for them to live there or even work there or even have a business there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are about whether they are still legitimate stakeholders and how you integrate them and the, the guys who can put a, a, a expensive business there, the guys who can buy an expensive condominium there, mm -hmm. and the homeless, mm -hmm. and put them all together in the same pot mm -hmm. and make that a, a kind of crucible mm -hmm. of these various very disparate stakeholders. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Well, I, I think that will be the measure of the success of planning. This will be a, a, a test as to what we're really capable of doing. Um, and if we can design for uh, low and moderate income uh, uh, families, if we can accommodate and improve uh, these social problems that we have right now, I mean, homelessness is a, I mean, it's growing. I mean, they're, they're, the census shows there are more and more people out on the streets. We tend to focus on the symptoms of that. We count the number of people, um, and we don't really look at really what the root causes are. You know, and part of it is, you know, we. We don't invest enough in public health. We don't invest enough in mental health. We don't, uh, and it's our high cost of housing. And it's working families, they're living in crowded situations. And you have an increase when you have people living close together that probably shouldn't. In other communities, they would, they would have their own homes. And that creates stress and tension, and that's why you know, uh, people get forced out on, on, onto the street. And, and a lot of people say, well, this is, it'll be a temporary thing. But, it ends up becoming more permanent. And so in addition to looking at the number of dollars that come in or the number of gleaming towers we build or star architects that we can bring in, we really should be looking at other measures of success, other measures of social welfare, of community wel welfare, that we've actually made an improvement. Uh, and there are examples of communities that 
um, have done this, that, uh, that have uh, stepped forward. I mean, I know we're looking at this housing first uh, proposal that, uh, you know, has, has been pushed in Portland. I mean, Portland is a great example of, a, good work. Uh, of a city that takes planning seriously. I mean, yeah. uh, as a transportation plan, remember, they, they took a riverfront expressway and turned it into a public park, right? Yeah. You know, Beautiful and, place. Uh, and, and make, they make the investments in public transit, not just a light rail system and a streetcar system, but they also... They bought that. They built that aerial tram uh, as well. Too. So, so there, there, there are examples of communities that, that, that do that. Another one that cuts, comes to mind uh, also is uh, the efforts in uh, New Orleans uh, following um, uh, Katrina yeah. and, and, and rebuilding through their efforts in, in terms of uh, land swaps and, and trying to build uh, more affordable housing uh, as well. New Orleans has a really interesting project, too. It's an art project. It's um, it's called evacue spots, and what they do is they, they set up these public art uh, pieces where people can gather, and vulnerable populations will be picked up and then taken to safe to safe areas. And it, it's kind of a neat uh, idea in terms yeah. of integrating uh, disaster planning, disaster planning <laughs> open space management, uh, an investment in the transportation system and, and infrastructure. So, I think if, if if we design for vulnerable populations. Um, if we design for our community, it'll be a better, it'll yeah. be a better community. Well, the role of the planner in all of this is clear, and as you, you know, mentioned before, it's the bridge between the ideas and the action, mm -hmm. and it's so important we do that. We get stuck in Hawaii on going to the action part. Right. So, so the burden is all on you, Carl. Oh, on me. Oh, so, no, yeah, I, th I, thought, I thought you were going to help me with this. Too, right? <laughs> that was part of the reason I came down here. <laughs> That's Carl Kim, a um, professor of planning, urban and regional planning at UH Manoa, and also uh, the Federal uh, Disaster Center. And we've been talking about planning public spaces in Hawaii because we have a program, which Carl's going to be traveling, but we have a program on May 21 where we can discuss this, and I'm really looking forward to that. And maybe we use some of your uh, footage here, Carl, in the program. Thank you so much. Yeah. we got to do this again. Okay. <laughs> we will. Hello. Thanks. <laughs>